Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, everyone. And welcome to the Fiat IFTA World Conference, the first one to be held in the Middle East. My name is Hassan Ghul. And uh, my name is Kevin Jones. And over the next three days, Hassan and I will be moderating the conference, keeping everything on track making sure that our speakers deliver great content, making sure that our speakers deliver great content on time. Uh, and we'll also be dishing out some great prizes. Uh, and I just wanted to kind of suggest to you, when you registered, you should have received, and I don't know if you can see it, uh, a, little, a, a little blue number. And this blue number will be the, uh, the mechanism that we use to distribute. Did somebody whistle at me? <laughs> I hope it was somebody's phone and not uh, somebody making a move. Um, uh, yeah, this little number uh, it will, will be the mechanism that we use to distribute the prizes. And my suggestion is that you just stick it in the back of your, uh, your, your uh, conference badge. And then when we pull out the numbers to distribute the prizes, you can turn the badge over, have a look, and say, yippee. Thank you, Kevin. One thing Kevin didn't mention is that if your badge number is called and you are not in the room, the badge number goes back and we withdraw another one. So you need to be in the room to get the gift. Anyway, without further ado, please welcome Mr. Jan Müller, the president of Fiat IFTA. Good morning, everybody. Thank you. I want that uh, Barcelona shirt with these autographs of the players. Now, do I need to stay in this room until what time? I got this lucky number. Good morning, everybody. I hope you all enjoyed last night's party, the opening, of, unofficial opening of this World Conference. And for those who just arrived, welcome to Dubai. Welcome at the 2013 World Conference of Fiat IFTA. 
First of all, I would like to express my thanks to the organizer and host of this World Conference, Al Arabiya News Channel. We are very grateful for the way in which you have provided Fiat Ifta with the temporary accommodation here in Dubai for people from 40 different countries. 40. I'm certain that this conference will be a memorable one. On behalf of all those concerned with Fiat Ifta, many thanks. Last year at the World Conference in London, I had the honor of addressing my first speech to you as the President. Under the presidency of my predecessor, Herbert Heiduk, some impressive steps were taken with regard to our image and corporate identity, the growth of our organization and our financial affairs, which are looking healthier than ever. When taking over the presidency, I said at Fiat IFTA was ready for the future. And I did not say so lightly. I had a talk with Mr. El Haj, director of Al Arabiya News and Current Affairs last night. He told me about the changes Al Arabiya is facing, about the influence of social media, which are forceful channels here in the Arabic world as well. And actually, we were talking about the effects of being part of the digital domain, the place where we all act or will act soon. We, and now I'm talking about us as archivists, are in a period of transition. We are all experiencing what it means to enter that digital domain. Some of us are already in full flow, while others are treating carefully, having just left the analog era. Whatever the case, we can state without a doubt that the world of audiovisual and broadcast archives has entered exciting yet complex times. But these have now become preconditions in the light of which we all shape our own strategies. And despite all the restrictions and complexities, an extremely inspiring era is unfolding before us. Unexpected opportunities present themselves when parties get together and collaborate, like here during this conference. This is facilitated more than ever before by the achievements of that digital domain. And from that perspective, Fiat IFTA has re-evaluated its own mission and vision within the Executive Council and in close cooperation with the Commission heads and its members, we defined Fiat IFTA's goal for the coming period at a joint strategic meeting in Hilversum this springtime. So let me return a moment to Fiat IFTA's mission, which is based on helping and inspiring. Our Federation meet once a year to get inspiration to discuss new ideas and concepts, and to hear one another's stories. Three days filled with inspiration, the main goal of our World Conference. There are many other ways in which we lend a helping hand. There's the new website, for example, and the regional conferences and joint seminars, which are often practical in character as well. And since the beginning of this year, we have the addition of two wonderful new initiatives. I cannot tell you how proud I am of our Fiat IFTA project, Save Your Archive, a program especially developed by a small team within Fiat IFTA uh, under the auspices of the Executive Council to help the survival of endangered audiovisual collections. The official starting signal was given to the program on the 1st of May this year, accompanied by the request for candidates to apply and for our members to help identify such endangered collections. Fiat IFTA wants to contribute to saving audiovisual heritage as well, all over the world. So we see UNESCO's World Day for Audiovisual Heritage on the 27th of October, which is tomorrow, as an ideal occasion for announcing the selected projects. I'm looking forward to it very much. The Executive Council took also a decision on another project, which still has the working title, the Knowledge and Training Team. Like the Save Your Archive program, this initiative is based on helping our members as well. It assists with the funding of their studies and training in the field of media and archive management. And finally, there's the long-standing Fiat IFTA initiative, the Achievement Awards, which encourage the creative use of archive material. This year, we will be presenting the awards for the 20th time, a milestone in the history of our world conferences and something we are really proud of too. The Fiat IFTA Awards have produced a long line of illustrious winners, each impressive in their own right and distinguished by the fact that the audiovisual collections 
have formed the basis for their productions. To celebrate 20 years of the Fiat IFTA Awards, we will pay special tribute in the conference lobby, next to this room here, to all these past winners. And on the evening of the award ceremony tonight, we are expecting a special guest as co-presenter. You are all here today because you want to go further, and rightly so. You want to hear new things and learn from your colleagues and from the speakers. You have been looking forward to a few days of annual immersion in a pool of information and inspiration. For the first time this year, many of our members have helped put together a program that I'm sure will fulfill everyone's inspirational requirements. Last night, at the opening party, I said something about the fact that our archives are our collective memories. Without them, we would miss an important part of our cultural heritage. We would lose a part of our identity. The theme of this World Conference is about that, about our task to keep the past recent. That's what we do, and that's what we want to discuss, to learn, and be inspired about. We are keeping memories. We help remember. On behalf of the whole Executive Council, the organizers, the hosts, the sponsors, and the speakers, I wish you all a very successful conference. Especially enjoy it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jan. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Sam Barnett, the CEO of NBC Group in Dubai. Good morning uh, and welcome. Um, we are honored to have this conference on our home territory. Uh, and the chance to address you first this morning. I want to explain why content and content management is really at the heart of our strategy and fundamental to all of our operations. Uh, in doing this, I'll talk a bit about our company and hopefully introduce you to something about our region as well. Now, given we're a media company, I thought I would start with a bit of media. Uh, so here are three minutes introduction to our group.
Now, some people say that starting with three minutes of Joel, Najwa, and Shireen is a mistake because afterwards they get 15 minutes of PowerPoint with Sam. But I will uh, hopefully tell you an interesting story uh, and I'll structure it. Can I have the PowerPoint presentation, please? I'm going to structure it around um, four main challenges that we face at NBC. The first is that we live in a complex neighborhood, and getting content in and, get, and, and getting it out is a tough task. Um, now, complex isn't just an English way of saying difficult or bad. We, have, we live in a, an, 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 in a region of huge opportunity. 350 million people speaking a similar, not exactly the same, but a similar language, means that for media companies, uh, this is a, hu a huge opportunity. When we broadcast the final episode of Arab Idol back in July, we had an audience of 92 million people, which makes our small company based in Media City here I think one of the, the, the major global players, because you don't get audiences of that size often. We're living in a wealthy uh, and growing neighborhood. Despite all the turmoil of, of international financial crises, the Arab Spring, um, we've been growing at a, a, a rate of 5% from 2008 and, and onwards. Now, 5% you know, would, would crash the computers of most European economists. Uh, this is a, a market which has got fundamental strength. Now, that story does uh, disguise uh, some, 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 some vast differences between, company, uh, between countries uh, in terms of growth uh, and also in terms of media regulation. Media in this part of the world is dominated by TV. The TV is on satellite, and the satellite is free to air. Now, we started... NBC Group started 20 years ago. We were the first private sector channel. We were based out of London um, and broadcasting up on satellite, which meant that we were able to broadcast content outside of the clutches of the various ministries of information. And that was critical to the growth because it meant that we could broadcast news that you could watch and didn't make you want to gouge your eyes out. Uh, it meant that we could put on content outside of the control of the various sensors. And it worked, and we kept it free by any set-top box, it's not encrypted, any set-top box, and you were able to watch our, our, our output. Now, at the start, the satellite equipment was very, was expensive, and so the penetration was low, but that rapidly changed. And we were the first in, but we were followed by dozens and then hundreds of others. Uh, we're now more than 700 channels in the region today. Um, satellite penetration is up at 95%. In Iraq, after the war in 2003, before that, satellite penetration was low because Saddam Hussein was reasonably strict on, on keeping media under his control, but it went from 15 to 90% in about three years. So satellite, satellites uh, is huge, and it's huge because, again, the content is free. And the government regulation remains critical. Particularly during Arab Spring. So during the, during the Arab Spring, uh, the news content is, is, it, it was highly sensitive. Governments did their best to try and control the satellites. As you can see, we, uh, on, on, in, in the Middle East, one satellite hits all, all, all of the different countries. When the Libyans took offense at the Al Arabiya uh, coverage, they shot a beam up onto our transponder taking it to try and take out Arabia. Now, for the technical people here, you'll understand, when you shoot a beam at one station, it takes out the whole transponder. So in April 2011, our network went down completely. And we spent three or four months playing cat and mouse as we chased around, uh, as we, we would put our uh, our, our channels back up on, on somewhere else in the satellite. The Libyans would come into work the next morning and take us down again. And we, were, we spent a long time doing this. The only, the only way we solved it in the end was putting Arabia right next to Libyan state TV. 
So if you take down our beer, you're going to take down Libyan State TV. So it's this, the satellite equivalent of civilian hostages. But that, that kind of solved it. But it wasn't just the Libyans. They showed how to do it. The Syrians have been doing it. Uh, there's claim that other, some other Czech countries are, uh, are doing it as well. Which, which, again, shows how important government control or being able to escape government control is in this market. Why is that relevant in, as we talk about going to the digital d domain? Because when people start talking about moving to other platforms, the question here is how, how, to what extent are those platforms controlled by governments? It's all very well to have internet distribution or mobile distribution, but the question is, uh, who, are, are you then controlled? Are, is your news coverage going to be stopped? NBC One, which you may have seen on the, on the, on, on the showreel, NBC One's our largest channel. It gets a share of 24% in Saudi Arabia. It's, it's BBC One, it's TFR, it's, it's one of the American networks. It's uh, standard uh, family entertainment. The branding positioning is you should be able to sit there and watch it with your family. If you're in the Gulf, you should be able to sit there and watch it with your family without any emb embarrassment. And for the, the people from the region, you'll know that NBC One is one of our safest channels. In one of the countries here, they wouldn't run it on them. They wouldn't stream it on, a, on on mobile because they said it was against the uh, it was against religion and uh, against the internal domestic regulations because we didn't veil our news presenters. It shows you in, in, in stark contrast the kind of problems we face as we start shifting to dig, uh, digital platforms. When Gaddafi was shot. The picture was taken on a mobile phone. But, it, but six million Libyans saw it on satellite TV. And it's satellite TV which has real power in this part of the world. And governments know it. And they're, they're eager to try and control us. And we are as eager to try and stay out, outside of that control. Now, we're not in London anymore. We came to Dubai in 2002. We came because the authorities in Dubai gave us a guarantee that if we came here, they wouldn't, con well, they, that they wouldn't uh, interfere with our editorial. We're here 12 years later because that, that, that promise has been good. But the other governments in the region um, are less happy. Number two, TV matters a lot. And increasingly, t uh, local content matters a lot. If you look at the, the hours spent watching TV in this region, it's higher than almost anywhere else in the world. In Saudi and Egypt, the minutes are, are, are higher. And despite everything happening on the internet uh, and other forms of media, TV continues to be robust. Um, YouTube, the, the YouTube, per capita consumption of YouTube in Saudi Arabia is the highest in the world. But still, TV remains a, a, a highly dominant form. Now, the interesting bit for, in, in terms of content is the, 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 which content people watch is changing dramatically. Uh, if I show you this chart here, I'm not, I you won't be able to read this. This is the, the top 25 programs in Saudi Arabia in the first seven months of the year. Again, I'm not going to go through them. Uh, two points of note. One, they're all ours, which is very nice. But secondly, it's local content. If we'd looked at this 10 years ago, we'd have had movies, we'd have had Western series, we'd have had other international content, but we have local content. Now, you might say Arab Idol is, is, is Arab Idol local content. Well, we'll claim it is. Yes, it's local people singing local acts in front of local judges to a local audience. That makes it a local show in our, in, in our book. Um, local content is, 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 is increasingly important. Um, that means it's an opportunity and a challenge. When, we were, when, when our business was a lot about importing international content, we, the rights were clear. The metadata was already there. It was easy to store. The formats were clear. Now we're playing locally. Uh, it, it's incumbent upon us to make that shift and ensure that the actual management of content is as clear as it was when we just used to uh, kind of offload it from the US. Uh, and that's an increasing challenge for us. Um, also, you know, with TV playing such an important role, and with, with some of the, the, the shows that we're putting out having such a huge impact, we do take, uh, we do take you know, 
We, are, have, we have a custodian role, and managing those assets uh, is, is, is part of one of the things we have to do. It's technology anarchy out there. Uh, and if we're going to win, we have to make sure our content fits on, on all the different platforms. So everyone's moving to HD, but in this part of the world, SD is, is still continuing. Um, we started on one satellite. Uh, another satellite launched. Abu Dhabi has launched another one. Qatar is launching another one, all in different positions. Encrypted platforms are multiplying. Uh, and the strategic imperative for us is to make sure any content that we do produce is pushed out on whatever platform people want to use. Now, that's probably the same wherever you are coming from. I'm sure that's, you, you have exa the, exactly the same experience in, in, in your markets. There's a, there's a few differences here, though. We have to play against non-rational players, governments with gas fields who want to spend on content, or who want to launch a new satellite or to a new platform. And it's difficult for us to try and make commercial decisions or to make single commercial bets if someone can, can get up one day and completely change the market based on no commercial logic. Now, we see that in content quite a lot. I'll give you an example. The uh, English Premier League used to be on one broadcaster here, and the broadcaster would pay $30 million for this. And they'd make about $30 million. So it, was, you know, it, it washed its face. Another broadcaster decided they wanted it, and they bid $110 million. Now, they made $30 million. So each year, for three years, they lost $80 million. I don't know where you're from, but in, in, that's still, in, in our world, is, is, a, is a big number. And we can't, we can't make those kind of bets. Uh, so it kind of wipes out the commercial uh, logic and rationale from the industry. And it's highly challenging to deal with. As for content, the same thing for infrastructure. So we have to be very concerned and agnostic and flexible and be willing to move one way and the other as we repackage our content and are able to respond to the technology changes. The last thing here about this market I want to say is that the advertising market here is still emerging. And that for those of us without a gas field, that puts on significant constraints. If you look at, on this chart, um, if you look at the advertising spend per capita in this part of the world compared to uh, other similar regions, it's vastly lower. Forget the first three in the, in, in, in the, uh, the, the, the um, the richer developed markets, if you look at in, in the same per capita income, we're perhaps one third or one quarter where we should be. Now, that's good news and bad news. The good news is we still have a, gro a growth story, so advertising can continue to grow. The bad news is we have less money right now. Um, and uh, when we're making dramas, we can afford to spend $40,000, 50000 for a drama episode. The Turks are spending two hundred and fifty, dollars and the Americans are spending a million. Uh, so we're still very constrained in, in what we can do. Now, that uh, also puts pressure on, our, on other, other spend. Uh, and I'm sure there are plenty of people here with, with technology budgets in the room or people who want to sell into those technology budgets. Uh, and your happiness, frankly, is contingent upon that advertising market continuing. Pay TV in this market is still highly limited, and the growth of, and the health of the industry is based on, 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 on the advertising numbers. My last point, I'm still reasonably astounded um, when those technology people are selling into us that the talk of business case, of savings, of return on investment tends to evaporate moments after the sale. And I'm left talking to people, the engineers who are talking more about change requests, scope changes, and product up upgrades. Um, and that's, a, you know, that's one of the frustrations, particularly given that we are in a difficult economic environment. But it's early in the morning and probably vulgar to talk about money too much, so I'll leave it there. Again, wish you a welcome to Dubai. Uh, I hope you enjoy your, your two days. If there's any questions, I'm happy to take them if we have time. Uh, otherwise, thank you very much. And since Sam has very kindly offered to, uh, to take questions, I suppose the, uh, the opportunity to present them from the floor is available. So does anybody from the floor 
have a question? And if so, please raise your hand and we'll get a microphone down to you. So, no questions. Do you mind if I start with one? Sure. You thought you might get away uh, scot-free. Um, but I wanted to ask, you put a, a slide up that spoke about 700 free-to-air channels, and you went on to talk about, and I apologise, I need to put my glasses on to read what I've written. And you went on to talk about what you described as technology anarchy, uh, when you said that there was no commercial logic in the way that technology decisions were made. But surely with 700 free-to-air channels all relying on advertising support for their funding and operations, uh, the market is over-serviced and probably not sustainable. Perhaps you could just comment on that. Sure, no, I would agree. Uh, but the, the assumption you're making is that the 700 are all relying on advertising. I think a, a big chunk of the market are, not, you know, are relying on capital from uh, individuals or governments, and they don't make money, they just spend it. Which is good news if you're selling, if you're selling technology spend, and I'm sure many of you do, do sell to those guys. But for the commercial players, it gives us a challenge because we have, to, we have to compete for ratings against those same people. Thank you. So does anybody else on the floor, have you used this as an opportunity to consider your own questions? Anybody? No? Sam, thank you very there's, much. There's one oh, is there one? Lady, Where? Lady in the centre. I'm going to bring you my microphone. So please introduce yourself and, uh, and then present the question. Assalamu alaikum. الأستاذ اللي تتكلم عن البث والإعلانات وال... بالتأكيد إن هدف الإعلان فادي، what was the question? Could, we, could you repeat the question, please? الأستاذ اللي تحدث عن التشويش التشويش إعلامي التداخل الإعلامي عند تعدد القنوات القنوات التي تسيطر عليها الحكومات بالتأكيد هو يهدف مورا هذا الكلام هو الانتشار الإعلامي لأكبر عدد من الجمهور لكنه هنا نقطة مهمة جدا وهي قنوات التقوية الإعلامية في بعض الدول تعاني من تشويش الإعلامي خاصة في أوقات الحروب من ضمنها قنوات الـ NBC العربية كثيرا في فترات تشويش الإعلامي تنقطع عن أكبر عدد خصوصا في الشرق الأوسط فماذا عن قنوات التقنية أو خطوط التقوية أو أبراج التقوية؟ So for those of you that haven't figured it out, that there are translation facilities available, and if you need a, a headset, they're available at the side. But I'm going to ask Hassan to just translate the question for us. Do you want to translate it? Uh, if I understand correctly, the, the lady's uh, point is that uh, Sam has spoken about the, uh, the free-to-air channels available and the interception that uh, some of the uh, parties have intercepted their, uh, the NBC, uh, NBC transmission. But she said he did not speak about the uh, for possibilities to strengthen the transmission of the Al Arabiya or the NBC channels. And she wanted Sam's view about these uh, possibilities to strengthen this transmission. 
Um, I, ho I hope I'll answer the question. If, if we're talking about physical strength and in, in, in boosting our, 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 the power of our transmission to avoid interception, we tried that, but, but if you're fighting against uh, governments, it's very difficult. If you're talking about um, the development of government channels and, and whether, I mean, I've, I, I, I tended to talk a bit negatively about the commercial impact of government channels when they crowd out private investment. But for sure, then, yeah, there, there was a role for government channels um, and in, in terms of uh, the, the social service, public service obligations. And you know, a lot of the, the technology and the development and the content will boost those channels as well. Our frustration is when those same government channels with a public service role seem to uh, try and attack on, uh, on, on, on clear commercial grounds, but with any, without any commercial rationale. Uh, that's our frustration. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, one at the back. Uh, have you got a microphone? There's one on its way to you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Sam. I have a question about the piracy. Yes. First, is it an issue in this region, in this part of the world? And second, how does it affect your avenue and investment as well? Thank you. Like, what's the last, the last word? How does it affect what? The piracy. Does it affect the avenue and the revenue as well? Revenue, and the investment, sorry. sorry. And is it an issue in this part of the world, especially, you know, it's a very hot place in the whole world, political-wise, economy-wise, everything? Yes, yeah, so piracy takes different forms here. Uh, we have the standard, you know, downloading um, films off internet, which you get everywhere. But I think there is one form of piracy which is particularly pernicious here, which is uh, are, the, are the satellite channels which broadcast movies for which they have no rights. And this is, this, is like, this is like the mass killing version of piracy because they, they, they'll go down to the DVD shop or download a movie from the internet and then broadcast it up on satellite and it covers 350 million people. I mean, most piracy elsewhere is one to one or, or it's peer sharing. But this, one, this, this stuff is, is pernicious. And the challenge is, it's not particularly the pirates, the problem is, is the lack of government regulation to be able to, to go and hit these guys. Uh, a lot of them were based uh, in, in Egypt and took the opportunity from the turmoil in Egypt to launch 15 different channels, all uh, uh, broadcasting uh, movies for which they had no right. And they've done tens of millions of dollars of, of, of damage to us. Uh, now, as, as the industry gets into gear and we put pressure back on the satellite providers, we're, we're taking them down one by one. But that, uh, that form of piracy where you, you, you take the DVD and then broadcast it free on, 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 on satellite has been particularly damaging. Okay, and, and we're going to take one more question, if there is one more question. And if there isn't, Nabil, perhaps you could make your way forward. And Sam, thank you very much. Thank you. So our next presenter, making his way to the front, Nabil Khatib, executive editor at Al Arabiya News Channel. And um, I'm afraid he arrived a little later than everybody else this morning. So he's going to surprise everybody, me included, with what I hope will become an inspirational presentation. This is very challenging introduction. <laughs> How are you, everybody? Morning, sleepy? It is challenging to talk about serious issues in the morning. This is what we are facing in the news business because I'm working in a news media, a news channel, and uh, in the morning when we open the, I open, switch to Al Arabiya, my channel, 
Yes. Sorry. No. What's that? I was looking for fear. Thank you. So the challenge in the morning, I switched to the news channel to see what, what, what is happening there. And then it's disturbing news about disturbing events all around. And I'm in dilemma whether to call my colleagues, editors, and ask them to have a lighter news in the morning. And that would mean uh, ignoring the serious events that are happening. So probably you are in this mood today, that dilemma. Serious talk, not serious talk. Anyway, welcome home in Dubai. And uh, I'm very delighted to have the chance to be with you and talk to you even for a few minutes. I truly believe that I am honored because I'm talking to the guardians of the memory of modern history. We are not sure of the events 500 years ago because there were no documentation. Now there are lots of means of documentation. And thanks to you, safeguarding uh, all those documents and whoever from historians will try to write the modern history, probably people will be affected more by a documentarist who will be producing a documentary running after you guys and asking for the accurate events, accurate footage to try to, to produce uh, a documentary about certain event or certain uh, historical uh, event. And, uh, but I wanted to make use of this opportunity, and this is a very unique opportunity for myself, to talk to you as a consumer to your efforts. I'm a news editor, and I am the consumer on a daily basis. There are lots of content management challenges when it comes to drama and other things, but when it comes to the archive versus news needs, news that are very essential now around the world, and in this part of the world in particular, where we have 14, 24, 7 news channels broadcasting in Arabic, whether to Arabs or uh, to Arabs, whether from the Arab countries or from abroad, uh, uh, it is very challenging for us uh, how to be uh, how to be fast getting the right footage uh, from the colleagues in in the library while I have a story in one hour or two hours, and this is maybe what is all about for us. Let me tell you a short story without boring you too much. Uh, some days ago, in New York Times, they published a big article about how President Obama gets bored when, they, when his colleagues or assistants or advisors start talking about Syrian issue. So the article was about the American position towards Syrian crisis, and probably the interesting introduction that uh, the writer chose is how Obama, whenever they start talking about this issue, he gets bored and he gets checking his BlackBerry. So my colleague decided to produce to produce uh, uh, a story about it, and uh, he started with Obama for. I mean, photos of Obama uh, checking his BlackBerry. And uh, now I am in trouble. 
because I thought that I have the video. Please bear with me. I wanted to show you the video. معارضة بالسلاح وكانت سامانثا باور وفق التقرير وهي سفيرة أوباما في الأمم المتحدة الأكثر تأييد. This is going, I mean, televising the article and showing how different close assistants to Obama see the crisis in in Syria and trying to influence the president. In and. إذا لكيري بل تجاوزت لصالح فكرة تسريح المعارضة السورية وصولا إلى القناعة بضرورة التدخل العسكري أيضا ويبقى أوباما مت All of a sudden in the end he was showing this footage I don't know if you can you could recall uh, President Obama was talking about the health care program less than a week ago and uh, his assistant who was Standing behind him in this red dress was collapsing, right? She was shaking, collapsing. Then he interrupted his speech and he took her. I asked his aides to took her in. So my what what was surprising to me when I was asking my colleague, what Syrian Syrian crisis has to do with? Obama's aide, who was just sick, and he was, she was checking. He said, you know, I was talking in the end that Obama is hesitant with his, in his position towards Syria. In Arabic, the word hesitant, yata'arjah, it's like, I mean, shaking, shaking, or hesitant. In Arabic, it's the same word. So he thought, I wanted to use the fact that she's shaking and say that he is shaking, he is hesitant. I mean, I said, this will confuse. Is the idea, and the, his idea, is it clear? I thought, what this has, I mean, this will confuse our viewers. He's a He said, yes, I couldn't find, I couldn't find something more uh, describing of Obama's position. How I would describe it, I mean, video-wise, I wanted something. I said, maybe you could find Obama, I mean, shaking I don't know, somewhere, somehow. I mean, we have lots of footage of Obama. He said, I tried. But I couldn't find it. And he's right. I tried and I couldn't find easily. I mean, easily, because he didn't have two days to look for that footage. He has. And in our case, in my estimation, we have around 30% of our news stories are coming, the, video, the footage is coming from the, from the, as you see, from the archive. So I had a dream based on that experience. Because the issue is how to deliver accurate and actual news. This is the substance of what we do. This is why we are there. This is why we ask for budget from SAM. Because we need to deliver accurate and actual news. We need it to be attractive. And we need it to be on time. And if we need that significant amount of footage from library every day, around 30%, and we need it on time for news, then it is a more challenge. How to find the way to have the right choice of the video and not to stuck like my colleague Abit uh, with using confusing footage to in his story, in his interesting story, it was very interesting story, very interesting text, very interesting treatment, but 
with a very wrong conclusion in the end, the video. Uh, we need to find the best methodology. We know that the heritage, the important heritage that you guard is there in the libraries. The issue is how to get to the, that five seconds of among hundreds of hundreds of hours or thousands of hours of video. Of course, for you being the guardians, this is very, I mean, basic question. Of course, we need to guard those videos and we need to find, but how to find the five seconds that I need quickly among thousands of hours? So, because your consumers are very busy always and always playing the role that they are in a hurry. So I will tell you about my dream. This is the nightmare that I saw. It's, by the way, it's from tapes. I found it on the internet. Yeah. VHS, remember? My dream is about a crasher, having a crasher. See the crasher? To put in it lots of tapes. I want to put all those videos in a crasher and to have the outcome as words. I want those words to be searchable. So whenever I have the words that are the outcome of the crasher, plus the description that you put, the metadata, to have the best ever, the most rich ever metadata of the description and of anything that have been said. So my friend, whenever he's looking for Obama with a red tie, shaking, hesitant, while he's shaking hand with Tony Blair, he can find it. It seems a dream. How to have every word, imagine that every word will be searchable. When I see the word, I click on it. It is like a link in the internet. It will be linked to the time code of the video in the tape list, and then I just have it. It is just in minutes. Maybe those solutions are there, I don't know. But I don't want this picture, and I was always looking for a way how to help my colleague and myself to avoid confusing videos and to find the right videos uh, whenever in news we are in a hurry. So I will get the right video, fast and timely, with quality, thanks to your efforts. This is all what I'm looking for, and I hope you will help us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Nabil. Is there, uh, one second, one second, please. Is there any question for, yes, there is a question. I was sure that there will be a question. One second, please. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Merev Buckman from DR, Denmark. Uh, very interesting, and I'm sure we can all help you with lots of ideas. Anyway, I was curious about one thing. You said that 30% uh, of your news broadcasting were archive footage? Is that a guess or is that based on, or did I misunderstand it or is it sort of rough estimate? Uh, you did not misunderstand me. It is a realistic estimate based on my daily experience in the newsroom. Uh, 
most of our content or our news that we broadcast is about our region because we broadcast in Arabic and for mainly Arabic speaking audiences. So people in the 22 Arab countries that are our target, uh, uh, this is for whom we broadcast. Until two years ago, it was very challenging to have an event happening in Egypt or in Morocco or in Tunisia and have the chance to talk about this event with video in hand because in previous Tunisia, for example, if there is an event, you are not allowed to go out of your bureau when I ask my correspondent to go and cover. He's not allowed to have the camera and go out unless he will send to a specific person in the president's office responsible for communication a description in a fax that I would like to go and cover this event and with this cameraman, with this ID number and myself, etc. And he has to wait until he will get the approval and then he will have this fax with approval and go out and that will mean probably they will send him the approval after everything is over and I will not be able as a TV to talk about it much. So that was the trend or the source of our, of us being poor in terms of footage that is reflecting what's happening now. Until now, in most of Arab countries, even after what happened and the uh, more freedom that is available, you cannot move the SNG to go and cover life without a specific pre-arrangement with the government. So the lack of uh, footage due to political and regulation uh, circumstances makes it for us uh, obligatory to go and try to rely on, uh, on archive. And we always need to mention that this is archive, of course, from so-and-so date. And uh, this is the only way where we can overcome those, uh, those uh, events because all what they are trying to do when they prevent us from covering the events timely in the field is to try to black out and to, to make us think that no need to cover it because we don't have footage. Uh, so we had to cover it, but we, need, we had to develop our graphics means and tools for simulations and uh, same for, for uh, using of uh, our archive. So if you got to know Dorothy, Dorothy, thank you Dorothy for all what you have done. Uh, Dorothy and her team is uh, working very hard with us because we are consumers who are consume a lot comparing to others. All right, thank you very much. I think Kevin has another question for you. So, um, so really my question, you, you, you used the example of Barack Obama and used the example of, of language as presenting problems when you're retrieving archive footage. Um, but could you just perhaps expand not only on the challenges of language but also of, of the challenges posed by different cultures? Um, is, the, is it an issue? Is the process of archiving, retrieving, storing information, or perhaps not storing is any different, but is certainly the process of retrieving archive footage different in this part of the world to, uh, to anywhere else? What I can recall as the major challenge that our colleagues in the library are facing every day while they are archiving, and us also while retrieving, uh, in Arabic, it's a challenge how to write the spelling of names, names of places, names of people. Uh, so if it is in English, Nabil is N-A-B-I-L or N-A-B-E-L, -E it's clear. But in Arabic, if you put Al-Khatib, which is my family name, with something called Hamza, I mean something that you need to add, if it is with Hamza or without Hamza, then you can find the name or you don't find the name if the librarian put this very tiny uh, tool in language or, or not. Uh, 
so often they are trying to resolve it by having several variations of the name in English and several variation of the name in Arabic. I mean, an English name in Arabic is a challenge, writing it. Not writing it, you can write it, but how to write it in a way that after two years when I look for it, I will guess that the librarian has used this particular, uh, this particular uh, uh, spelling. Same as for uh, Arabic, Arabic uh, names of places and people, when you get those, this data and you archive it in English of Arabic names, it is a very big challenge. So some of the technical solutions is like in Google, they just ignore the variations, I mean, make it uh, richer. Uh, in our case, they are trying to put five, six variations of the same name spelling in Arabic and same as in Arabic. It is often a challenge how to retrieve. It is often a challenge because I know that the MBC is 20 years old, as uh, Sam have said, or 21, and uh, our colleagues just maybe five or six years ago they started putting the different variation. So it is a long way to go, but it is a challenge. Yes, I believe. Thank you, Nabil. Is there any more questions for Mr. Nabil from the floor? No? Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> All right. We, we are ahead of schedule, which is, uh, which is good news. So we can, uh, we, uh, the, the next thing on the agenda is the coffee break. Uh, so we can, uh, we can go out for the coffee break, but uh, Please, we need you back here at 11.25, which is in about 35 minutes. But let me just say one, thing, one important thing. The first draw for uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the gifts will be done immediately after the break. So we will do the first draw at 11.30. And if you are not in the room at 11.30 and your number is drawn, you lose the gift. Have a good coffee break. <laughs>